Greetings. I'm recording this message on Tuesday, March 8th, 2020. And I view it as a, a special message that's going to look at this key question of how does one approach God? And I'm going to begin in the negative and, and work to the positive. So this week we'll take a break from looking at the Welsh Calvinistic Methodists. But when we do return, we'll be looking at the year of 1743, a great year of God pouring out his spirit upon these Welsh people. But for this week, what I want to focus on, what we're all aware of, is that there's great turmoil within the world. Uh, Russia has aggressively and without cause attacked Ukraine. Uh, Russia is being led by a tyrant. And there's all sorts of atrocities being committed against civilians, including women and children. There's a humanitarian crisis. And so you have superpowers standing up to one another. And Russia, along with other allies of Russia, have nuclear weapons, and so does NATO countries. So it would be very easy for things to quickly spin out of control and for our world to change forever because of it. Because we have no certainty of where this is going to end. We look at the pandemic. I think it's been recorded that there's been 6 million additional lives lost because of the pandemic. And even if you think that that's overstated, let's just assume it's 3 million lives. What it does show, and my point is, the frailty and the fragile um, lives that we live. That, yeah, we live um, in uncertain times, and, and honestly, we, we always have. But they're certainly um, highlighted with the fact of coming through a pandemic. And now, um, for the first time since World War II, you have a war um, on the continent of Europe. And so what has led us to this point and what God tells us and what the Bible shows us time and time again is when people view themselves as their own gods, then they can decide who lives and who dies. They will do what is right in their own sight. Man without God will always go astray, hating, being hated and hating one another, as the Bible tells us. Man is a rebel at his very core. And what drives this view of acting as if we're our own gods is the sin of self-righteousness. It's self-righteousness, I'm convinced, more and more that prevent souls from ever coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ. It is self-righteousness that claims that um, I know what is right, I know what is moral, I know what is good. Self-righteousness causes us to cancel others. It causes us to murder people with our tongues. It causes us to say, I'm better than you, though we might say it in very cleverly disguised ways. It causes politicians to act as if other politicians are evil. They're good and the other person is evil. Not that they disagree over policies, but they attack each other's character. So self-righteousness is what's driving us. You know, many times, and just happened recently, you look at, the judgment that God brought against Sodom and Gomorrah. And people right away will equate cities that are, in their view, like Sodom and Gomorrah. And, and the Lord brought judgment on them, so they'll bring judgment on these people. But what ends up happening, though, is, is I see that again as more self-righteousness. Because that same judgment against Sodom and Gomorrah could be the same judgment uh, people are under in the most beautiful Places where people are hospitable are under the same judgment. And the point being is, in Romans, at the end of Romans 1, it talks about people in rebellion and turning their backs on God, and this is what the Bible says about them. Beginning with verse 29, chapter 1, they are filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceitful, maliciousness. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil. So not just practicing evil, not just doing evil, but inventors of evil. Disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. 
though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. They not not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. So they, they praise them. So you look at that and you go, well, that's like Sodom and Gomorrah, and they deserve God's judgment because these are overt sins. You know, change, you know embracing what is unnatural versus what is natural. You know, um, just completely forgetting about God and turning your back on him. These are very overt sins. But the problem is, and I've shared this before, in the beginning of chapter 2 of Romans, Paul begins, while he's speaking to Jewish people, but these are moral people. But he tells these moral people who who commit covert sins, secret sins, like self-righteousness. Believing that you're better than other people. You're grading yourself on a curve. And you're deceiving yourself because you're not like other people. And you make sure that within your orbit, you make sure that you have people that reflect yourself, right? And these moral people that Paul describes in Romans 2 tells them they are condemned as equally as the first group of people, even though they're moral. Why? Because they're self-seekers. They don't know God. Then you have a third group at the end of Romans 2, and these are the religious people. These are the people, if you will, on the mountaintops. And you have the moral people at the foot of the mountain. Then you got the people who are committing overt sins in the, in, the, um, in the caves. And these religious people on the top of the mountain say, look, I'm closer to God because I'm on the top of the mountain. I've got these religious duties and principles and theology that I keep. But Paul says, you're also condemned. Why? Because you haven't been reconciled to God. You're just religious professors. You feel good about yourself. You feel good about other people who believe just like you do. But all three groups are dead in their self-righteousness. It is self-righteousness that keeps us from seeing the fact that we need a Savior. The Bible has one theme, one story. It's a story of salvation. And salvation... To understand salvation, it it means to be rescued. And we're rescued by a person. And his name is Jesus Christ. So in Adam came sin, and through sin came death, and we belong to Adam. But God himself came as a babe to live a life that you and I can't live, and he fulfilled every covenant that is required of him. He lived a righteous life. So that through one man's disobedience, we were led astray, but one man's faithfulness, we can be reconciled to God. That is what the Bible teaches. That is what you and I need. We need a Savior. A real Savior. Somebody who's capable of saving. Somebody who not only makes promises, but keeps his promises, and he shows that those promises indeed have been kept. This is why Christ did these miracles, so that you and I would know that he's telling us the truth, including his resurrection and his ascension. All right? And that what we need more than anything else is not to become an ethical person or a moral person or an outstanding citizen or a great father or or, or wife or, or mother or, or husband. What you and I need is life. And what God promises us through his son is to give us his spirit so that you and I could actually live and not just merely survive in our flesh and our sins. That's what the Bible teaches us. And so what we need to see and what we don't see is our need of a real savior and Christ is capable of saving us. And so now the question then is, knowing that, seeing that, not being confused by it, how do we come to the Lord? Because the Bible also teaches us the ways of man seem right to him, but they lead to death. I can't say that enough times. So for example, and this is what makes people feel uncomfortable, within American evangelical churches, you're a pastor, you're an elder, you're a committed church member. 
Go talk to your children. Ask them, how do I get to heaven? Because there are a number of Christian churches who spend a lot of time and energy trying to evangelize others without ever never recognizing they themselves don't have a gospel to share. So if you go ask your children, what you're likely to find is the following. These are quotes. To churches that embrace the Great Commission, the Great Commission. You ask the children, how do you get to heaven? Quote, I don't know. Second, give money to the church. Third, obey God. Or fourth, a lot of times of blank, empty stares. I mean, even when you ask pastors or elders or deacons, can you tell me straightforward, how does one get reconciled with God? They're fearful. They're hesitant about answering the question. I don't expect children to be able to give, you know, a theological statement. But I do expect children to be able to say, I get to heaven by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I do expect children and adults to be able to say plainly, I am saved by a person. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's the Son of the living God. He is the Savior. He is the Messiah of this world. And I am saved by him, period. But there's great confusion about that. Because, again, in our self-righteousness, coming to faith and being reconciled to God through a person by faith, due to his meritous works, which are imputed to us as a gift, seems too good to be true. Justification by faith in Christ means that everything that's true of Christ is true of you and I if we're in Christ. So Christ never sinned. Christ never disappointed his Father. Christ lived that perfect and righteous life. Therefore, that has been imputed to us. Whatever is true of Christ is true of us. And God did it this way, in part, because so therefore nobody can boast. You see, my friend, you make decisions. I make decisions. But I got news for you. God makes decisions too. He has a say-so on how the world events come and what happens within the lives of people here on earth. So you make decisions? Well, I got news for you. God makes decisions as well. And he is holy, he is right, righteous, he is majestic, he is glorious. He has dominion and authority. And no one, in Psalms 2 as it says, the nations rage against him. And the Lord laughs at them as they try to fight against the Lord, you know. But God graciously says in Psalms 2, Kiss the son lest he be angry with you. Humble yourself. Don't let self-righteousness ruin you. Don't let self-righteousness destroy your soul. To double down on your sins. To stay in Satan's camp. Kiss the son lest he be angry with you. The best words that I know how to approach God come from John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. I've shared it before. I'm going to share it again. What Bunyan um, shows us in Pilgrim's Progress between a conversation between Christian and hopeful and on their journey to the celestial city, they're running into, into some troubles. And Christian says, let's start talking about our faith and how we came to faith in the Lord. And as Hopeful is sharing with Christian, Hopeful makes this startling statement. He said, you know, I never realized that salvation began with recognizing my sins, the conviction of sin. My friend, because of self-righteousness, we don't see our sins. And because we don't see our sins, 
there's no conviction. And no conviction, no salvation. We're just dead in our sins. We, we made a decision to follow Christ without actually ever being born again. And what Bunyan reveals is that conviction of sin is not something that we brought upon ourselves, but it's the Spirit of God moving within us to show us our sins. And yes, it is dark and it is it causes people to cry. It causes people to get on their knees. It causes people to admit things that they honestly never thought they would ever admit openly. But that's the power of God. But there is a mourning. There is forgiveness. There is reconciliation. You can be made clean by the blood of Jesus Christ. Conviction of sin brought on by the Spirit is to be embraced. It's not to be run away from. It's not to be fought with. You are to embrace it. And so how does one come to God? Not through self-righteousness. Not through their own thinking. Not what seems right in their own mind. But as a beggar. Recognizing that salvation begins with the conviction of sins. And that's why the old time preachers used to always say, ask God to show your sins. And once he does, then ask him to show you your Savior. Well, in the conversation between Christian and Hopeful, this Christian asked, how did you approach God? And this is what um, Hopeful said because of the advice that he got from a good man <laughs> who had a good book in his hand and told Hopeful to do the following. And he told me, I must entreat upon my knees with all my heart and soul the Father to reveal him to me. Then I asked him further how I must make my supplication to him. And he said, Go, and thou shalt find him upon a mercy seat, where he sits all year long to give pardon and forgiveness to them that come. I told him that I knew not, no, did not know what to say when I come. And he bid me to say to, to this effect, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, and make me to know and believe in Jesus Christ. For I see that if his righteousness had not been, or I have not the faith in that righteousness, I am utterly cast away. Lord, I have heard that thou art a merciful God, and has ordained that thy Son, Jesus Christ, should be the Savior of the world, and moreover, that thou art willing to bestow upon such a poor sinner as I am, and I am a sinner indeed. Lord, take therefore this opportunity, and magnify thy grace, and the salvation of my soul, through the Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Yeah. Approach God as a beggar on your knees, trusting in what he has said and what he has done, recognizing who you truly are and are in your need for a savior. It's true of you, it's true of me, it's true of every living soul in this world. So during these times of war, lawlessness, pandemics, accidents. It shows us the fragility of life. And I beseech everyone who listens to this message to fly to Jesus Christ. You could say the gospel message can simply be said as this, come, come to the Lord, right? You can think of the prophet Isaiah, just come. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Put your faith and trust in him. For he is God, he is King, he is Lord, and he's the only one capable of saving you and your family. Share this true gospel message that we are saved by a person and his name is Jesus Christ. God bless.